them to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole mean measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will be in all things, grow up into him who is the head of that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you. Thank you. state of Utah, there's something called the Pando Aspen Grove, which covers 103 acres. To the average person, as you look out upon these 103 acres, you might see thousands of trees. But if you look below the, the roots and the ground, you find out that it is not thousands of trees but it is one organism. One root system connects thousands and thousands of trees and over 100 acres. And it's in that one organism, when it's unified, there's great power and great strength. And the same thing is true in the church, is that when we are together and our roots are intertwined and we're locked together, there's great power, there's great strength. But when we're divided, we're more fighting, we're trying to see who's right and who's wrong, it's divisive and it's super unhealthy for us. Tonight, that's what we're going to talk about, is how do we work together as the body of Christ and be unified? We know that unity is important because one of Jesus' final prayers in the Garden of Gethsemane in John chapter 17, he said, I am not asking on behalf of them alone, but also on behalf of those who will believe in the future, speaking of us, who will believe in me through their message. And all of them may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Did you catch that? He's praying that we will be unified. And one of the reasons he says it's important is so that the world may believe that Jesus really was God's son. When we're unified and we have power in that, it gives meaning to God's messenger, Jesus Christ. It verifies that he truly was the son of God. But often we're fighting among ourselves. If you look through history, the Center for the Study of Global Christianity at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary discovered that there was an estimated 34,000 denominations, 34,000 denominations in 2000, rising to an estimate of 43,000 in 2012. These numbers have exploded from 1,600 in the year 1,900. So think of it, I have on the board there you might not be able to see your branch or your denomination may not be represented on the screen. And I'm sorry, it's not real clear from here. But this represents how the church has splintered since Jesus prayed that prayer in John chapter 17. Many of those splits come from actually historical events. Some of those splits actually had nothing to do with theology, but more had to do with political fighting between countries and nations. And so... There we are. How many of you actually know the denomination of, if you were raised in the church, okay, for those of you raised in the church, can I, I'm not going to ask you to call it out right now, but how many of you know the denomination you were, you were raised in? You can name it, okay? How many of you were raised in a non-denominational church? Can you raise your hand, all right? More than likely, you're not non-denominational, by the way. You're probably Baptist, because that's what a lot of them are. All right? The, the trend has to become to get rid of a tag and just name yourself non-denominational, which in reality, some of them may be. Many of them are not. 
If I were to ask you to say the name of your denomination, I'll have to count of three. All right, let's go ahead and do that. To count of three, say your denomination. One, two, three. Yes. Yes. All right, good. I understood that very, very well. All right. That was pretty bad. Very, very confusing. Lots of people. Uh, by the way, Molly, yes, I heard your strong cat. I love it. Not many can match you in your strength and pride. All right. But I have to tell you, the splintering of denominations is not a new thing. It's something that's been around a long time. As early as the New Testament, if you want to see a passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 4, there's a great passage where Paul is yelling at the church in Corinth, which had not been around very long. But what's some of the problems they're having? Well, look at the screen if you want to read along with me. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 4. Brothers and sisters, I do not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly. Mere infants in Christ. So they're basically spiritually immature. They need to grow up. Why? He gives, I gave you milk, but not solid food, for you are not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one of you says, I follow Paul, and another says, I follow Paulus, are you not mere human beings? He's telling them, you need to grow up. In your church, in your own community, some of you are saying, well, I follow Paul. I'm like Paul, and I, I follow his doctrine. While others of you are going, well, I follow Paul. I'm following him. I'm going to go after him. While some of you are going, well, I follow Luther. I'm going to be a Lutheran. I'm going, to, I'm going to be a Presbyterian. I guess he's called a Presbyterian. I don't know who I follow, what the name is. You know? I don't know. But so often, that's what we do. We go after Paul or Paulus when he's saying, wake up. You're acting like infants. You're being spiritually immature. There's so much more that I want to teach you. There's so much more that you could do and you could grow. But you've got to get over your divisions among yourselves. There's two different ways to view the body of Christ. And I want to share this with you because this really has changed my perspective of the church. When I, by the way, if I use the term body of Christ, I re I'm referring to the group of people who follow after the teachings of Jesus. Another word you could call that is the church. All right? So I'm going to give you two different ways that you can view the church. Some people view the church as a bounded set. A bounded set means like this. There is a circle or a square, and there are people inside the square, and there are people outside the square. And I choose, or someone chooses, who's in and who's out. That's my view of the church. Those lines are often made up of a very variety of different things. Sometimes it's made up by church membership. You got to be a church member, so you're inside the square. Or you have to believe like us. You have to hold to a certain doctrine. Or you have to live by a certain lifestyle. Or you have to do this. Otherwise, you're outside the square. The key word in viewing this is the word fences. People who view the church like a bounded set want to build fences to keep the good animals in to keep the bad animals out. They have to keep the church pure. And so most of the time, if you view church as a bounded set, you're concerned about keeping fences up to protect. Well, there's some problems with that. And I think there's a much healthier way of us viewing the church in today's world. Because I grew up in a bounded set. I grew up actually probably in a square or a circle so tight that none of you actually probably would have counted as Christians. That's how conservative the church I was in, all right? We were taught growing up that we needed to save the Southern Baptists, all right? All right, that's how bad it was. Ain't nobody believed the Bible like us. Nobody knew Jesus except for us. And so when I went to the annual conference for my denomination, I was in college. 
And I remember they stood up front and they voted on three different things to exclude them from our circle. And they were Disney, oh, no. <laughs> Promise Keepers, and Billy Graham. <laughs> How do you exclude Billy Graham from Christianity? I don't know. But that's how I grew up. And I just sat there and I go, what is wrong with these people? They're drawing circles and they don't have the power to do that. They don't have the ability to do that. Because I'll tell you what, Jesus didn't talk about church membership. He didn't draw lines. He did say, by their fruit, you will know them. By your fruit, you will know them. And I don't know about you, but not many churches are, are dealing with the fruit of the Spirit. They're dealing more with other things. So I believe there's a better way to view the church, and that is through a centered set. In a centered set, do not think of it as fences. This would be the farmer who has thousands of acres. Therefore, he cannot build fences, so what he does is he digs wells. He will dig a well in the middle of his ground, and therefore, what happens? The animals on his farm or in his cattle will stay close enough to the well. They may go out, they may come back, but they will always be drawn back to the source of life, which is the well. And I want to tell you that in, our, in this example, Jesus Christ is the well. He is the center of the church. He is the life. He is the water. He is the one that draws us back to himself, to the center of who we are as Christians. And, you know, I'm not in charge of building fences. And people might be in various some might be walking towards the, the, the well, some might be leaving the well, some might be circling. I don't know, but I'm not in charge. All I am is I'm a follower of the well, and I'm a believer in the well. And honestly, when I see others, I'm probably going to tell them, hey, did you know there's a well right over there, and it's good. I'm not worried about who's in and who's out. I'm just... I'm a follower of the well. And that's how a centered set looks at the church, not as fences, but as a well. And as one gets closer to the center, the more Christ-like one becomes in their behavior. Core members of the church will exhibit the features of Christ's radical lifestyle, like acceptance, love, joy, peace, long-suffering. Well, if you have your Bibles, Ephesians chapter 4 is another passage that talks about the church. It was the passage read tonight in our, um, uh, right before I, I got up. And in Ephesians verses 1 through 6, Paul makes a call for unity. He says, As a prisoner of the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. By the way, what does that sound like? Sounds like fruit to me, right? Fruit. Be those things. Then make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Did you notice a key word there? He's calling us to be one over and over and over again. The unity of the body is so very important. Now, at the same time, we do need to acknowledge that we have some differences. In this particular passage, Paul is talking about spiritual gifts because we're not all the same. Verse 11, he says, So Christ himself gave us apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service. He had this amazing ability to gift us each with a spiritual gift so that we can use that gift to build up each other. Why? So we can build our own kingdoms and build up fences? No, but so that we can build up each other and become more and more unified as the body of Christ. 
That's what we should be using our gifts for. And so then he goes on with this imagery of the mature body of Christ in verse 14 through 16. He said, then, after we've built each other up into the fullness of Christ, then we will no longer be infants. Notice that spiritual maturity thing again? Then we'll no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and every cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Not being blown back and forth, the word is often used as doctrine, by every wind of doctrine. Well, so-and-so believes this. I guess I believe this. And then I'm blown over here by this doctrine. I'm not sure what to believe here. Doctrine, doctrine, doctrine. Can I tell you, as somebody who's been studying doctrine for probably 20 years of their life, the more I study, in some ways there's so much more that there is to study, and more confusing, and very hard to settle on. And there are times when I just want to admit to you where I go, wow, I don't know, but this book maybe wasn't written so that I could have my doctrine figured out. Maybe, maybe Jesus didn't come to teach doctrine. He came to die for us and to show us a life and for us to experience the water of the well that only he could give. So don't be like infants tossed by every doctrine, weaving back and forth. But being, we will, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. We need to show love to one another as we work side by side. Yeah. Love to one another as we work side by side. That will be a marker of your spiritual maturity. There are, unfortunately, many reasons why we continue to remain divided. One of the reasons is fear. We're dominated by fear. The Linux globe, um, and the picture is on the screen, is from 1510. It's one of the oldest known globes in the world. And on this globe, you can see there are many sea creatures, and it was during medieval times very common when they didn't know what was in a certain area, they would put a sea creature. Partly just for artistic ability, but partly it just represented the unknown, and they didn't know what was necessarily there. And this globe in particular, out in the sea, has the word, here be dragons. Here be dragons. Why? Because we don't know what's there, but it's very, very scary. And I don't know about you, but I was born and raised in this denomination, and over there where they be, they be very, very scary. And I don't know about you, but I don't know them. <laughs> they be very, very scary. Yeah. And this concept of the others can cause so much division. And I don't say that because um, that was natural for me. This was instilled into my life. I don't know, did you guys ever get taught the slippery slope argument? for almost every aspect of your Christian walk. And it was like, don't you hang out with those Southern Baptists. They don't believe the Bible. Don't you go to that seminary. They don't teach the Bible. Don't you do this, because they will lead you down a slippery slope. And soon, you won't even be a Christ follower. Can I tell you that the church that I grew up in probably no longer considers me a Christian? Why? Because I believe that women can preach. 
and teach and are part of the church in a powerful way. And they don't think I'm a Christian anymore. And you know what? That's okay. They can have their world, but I'm not going to be afraid. And I'm going to work with others who are different from me. And not be afraid because God calls us to be one and to work together. A second reason we can be divided is pride rather than humility. And the third reason is we can be motivated by control rather than trust. Sometimes we want to control what others believe because we think we're right. And so we work and try to control that. It takes trust to work together. Trust that we're moving towards the same well. That that person has experienced that well. Um, recently in one of my classes I had the opportunity to work along someone who comes from theologically a different perspective than me. And so we were working together on this project in class and we were talking about it, how we were going to do it, and, and whether, how we were going to do it, and how we were going to set it up. And, and there was tension between us as we were talking about it. And then I, I just stopped the conversation and I looked at the student and I said, wait, do you trust me? And she gave me a look like, what? And she kind of said, yeah, but... And then I looked at her and I said, I trust you, you need to trust me. That we are co-followers of Jesus, seeking the well and drawing others to the well. May I encourage you, as you join the UND campus, that we will love each other and work side by side so others may know and come to the well. Let's pray.